Could you open in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this place. Lord, we appreciate the safety and the convenience it is to gather. Lord, we just pray that you put a special blessing on all who gather here today. Lord, we long to hear from your word. We want to grow. We want to be more like Christ. Lord, I just pray that you would um, quicken the Holy Spirit in us and help us really contemplate how we may be able to do that in a really effective way. Thank you for Keith. I pray that you just speak through him this morning. I pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So as we're looking at this, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we're going through uh, different forms of religion, um, so to speak. There are actually two. There's salvation by works, and there's salvation by grace. Of course, salvation by works doesn't cut it with God. It's his grace that saves us, and it's important for us to remember this. And today, I was going to be looking at progressive, progressive Christianity. Uh, I'm actually going to be taking this act as two different looks. One is what their denials are, um, and looking at the tenets of, of their faith what they call faith, um, they have some rather interesting denials. And the first one has to do with the atonement. If, if you notice, I have headings here, different, um, different things that we look at that they have actually spoken out on. And on the issue of the atonement, I'm going to read this. Um, Reverend Steve Chalk, a Baptist leader of the UK's progressive evangelicals from Christianity Today, traditional view of atonement cheapens God's forgiveness, said Steve Chalk. Then he calls penal substitutionary atonement cosmic child abuse. And that's how he looks at it. And that's the way they teach the idea of when Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that they're looking at that as child abuse, and it can't be right. That's the way they're looking at this. Um, and that's pretty much held by most progressive Christians. Now, we're going to find that on a lot of these, they, some will ad adhere to it, some will downplay it, and some will absolutely say no, what, you know, they'll deny. But the point of the matter is that most of what they're doing is denying what we know to be the truth from the scriptures. So somebody want to read Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, and this is, again, the Bible's answer to what they're saying. Carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us had turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Okay, and verse 6 says it very clearly. He says, the, the, the prophet says, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And then somebody want to read uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
Okay, and here we're seeing the scriptures are teaching very clearly, and this is Paul saying this to the Corinthians, that, that Jesus knew no sin. This is actually going to speak to um, another idea as well that we'll see later. But Jesus knew no sin, but he made him to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, there's this exchange, my sin for his righteousness. And that's an important thing for us to understand, that that's what um, penal substitutionary atonement is all about. He took the penalty. He was the substitute. He paid the debt. I benefit from that payment. Somebody want to read Galatians 1, 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To whom be the glory forever. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. So Paul is laying a very powerful statement about what it means to preach another gospel which is not of the same kind. Now what is the kind of gospel? He says, and and this is an important part of this, he says in verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and then verse 4, who gave himself. See, Their idea of this cosmic child abuse, the father causing the son to be punished. No, the son did this of his own volition. He did this out of his choice. He chose to come. He chose to give himself as a substitute for me. So there's no child abuse here as as they try to make it out to be. But it is true. Sin needs to be dealt with. And the only way to deal with it is to deal with it. Somebody had to pay the penalty. And Jesus said, they can't pay their own penalty. I will go down and pay that penalty that they may then have my righteousness that they may then not have to pay the price for what they have done. And that's what it's all about. And that's an important part of salvation. That's a core idea. And you'll notice that most of these ideas that these are, are looking at, these denials that they're getting at, are not doctrine. They are dogma. And... There's a difference. Dogma is what you must absolutely believe to be saved. I must believe that Jesus died for my sins. If I don't believe that, I'm not saved. That's Satan's attack on the gospel. And this is what progressive Christianity is trying to do to what a lot of people call the church. Progressive Christianity is as far from the church as if you were a Buddhist or any other Eastern religion or any other kinds of religion. And again, it is a matter of trying to earn forgiveness from God. Then we look at the biblical authority. Somebody want, okay, I'm going to read this. The first core taken from progressive Christianity org 
we see, and I'm going to read this. This is, um, okay, we see that the Bible does not hold authority over the believer. Now, this is from their own website, somebody that claims to be speaking for progressive Christianity. And it says, we believe that the following, following the way and teachings of Jesus can lead to experiencing sacredness. That's kind of a meaningless term. Wholeness and unity of all life, even as we recognize that the Spirit moves in beneficial ways and in many faith traditions. You can be Muslim. You're fine with progressive Christians. You could believe in Buddha, you'd be fine with progressive Christians. The whole idea is, and this is why this really is a denial of the authority of the scriptures. The scriptures teach, and Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's as simple as that. There's one way, and Jesus is that way. And we need to remember that that is the case, that the only way we can come to God is through Jesus. Oh, you better believe it. Well, I'm sure he inspired all their teachings directly. So, somebody want to read 2 Timothy 3, 13 through 17. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have feared have learned them, and that from childhood you would have known the sacred writings which have been able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So we see here that the scriptures are what equip us. We also see Paul talking about here that we continue in the things, or that he's encouraging Timothy to continue in the things that he's learned and become convinced of, and that, that these sacred writings are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. But it's also important to understand that proper doctrine from the scripture, as Paul says in Ephesians, keeps us from being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And you'll see that that, that is the case. And we're going to be looking at um, some of what progression, progressive Christians, so to speak, um, affirm next week. And when we do, we will see it's not only strange, but they're being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Um, so, somebody, okay. Also, they do not believe in this idea of original sin. I'm going to read this. This is actually from WhiteHouseInn.org. It's a quote. They have a thing, um, Elisa Childers, they took and um, worked with it and put together, a, she's been studying this movement for a long time, and they took a, an article she wrote and by her permission brought it in to their website. And this is what they say, or what she said about original sin. 
It says the doctrine of original sin is roundly rejected in progressive Christianity with the idea of original blessing put in its place. Progressive Christians don't typically deny that sin exists or that it is a bad thing, but they deny the idea that we have some sort of sin nature that has passed down to us from Adam and Eve. Instead, progressive Christians often teach that sin isn't what separates us from God, but our own self-imposed shame. In the progressive view, it is often, it's often taught that we simply need to realize that we were never separated in the first place. That we are beloved and accepted by God just as we are. Another lie from Satan. Oh, you haven't been separated from God. God didn't say, in that day you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. No, you're not dead. You're God's child. That's what they're saying. And that ties into, they don't believe in the biblical authority. They don't believe that the Bible says what it says and means what it means. They don't care what the Bible says. They're going to say, no, 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 it's not that. It's what I say it is. And that's one of the major things about false religions. They argue with God. And in doing that, they are accepting the lies of Satan and propagating them to other people and trying to lead them away from the faith or make it so that they never come to understand what salvation is truly about. And this is important for us to understand. This is the spiritual battle. This is the battle of truth versus lies. And it's important for us to understand that the truth is what we need to understand and how we need to talk about it. Um, somebody want to read Genesis 3, 6 through 8. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So we see here, it's very clear, Adam and Eve sinned. And that led to separation from God immediately. There didn't need to be any time between when Adam and Eve sinned and when, when they realized that they did something wrong and they wanted to hide from God. The shame was real because the shame was based on their sin. And since all of us have descended from Adam and Eve, the shame is real. And the shame is because we were born in sin. And we are sinners. And we need his forgiveness. Somebody want to read Romans 3, 9 through 12. The, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged charge that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is no, none who does good. 
There is not even one. Not even one. That's Paul's conclusion about sin. Not one righteous person on the earth. The only righteous person that ever lived was Jesus. And it was through his righteousness that we can be forgiven. Psalm 53, verses 1 to 3, are actually one of the passages in the Old Testament where this quote comes from. Uh, somebody want to read Psalm 53, 1 to 3? Sure. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have committed abominable justice. There is no one who does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who understands, who seeks after God. Every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so we see here, none who do good. And the psalmist is saying, they have come, become totally unprofitable. Nothing they can do would be good. Only redemption will fix the problem. Now, in this last page, we're looking at, um, there were different headings that I combined into one, and I called it the person of Jesus, his deity, physical resurrection, virgin birth, and sinlessness. These are all areas, again, that are part of dogma. We need to believe in every one of these points. I'm going to show you that these are crucial to our salvation, these ideas. Because that is what the scriptures teach about Jesus. Um, somebody want to read John 8, 52 through 58. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too, whom, you, whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I would be, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Okay, and then they took up stones to try and stone him at that point. But the point that's getting at here, this phrase, I am, notice how it looks like it's past tense kind of a thing before Abraham was, and then he says, I am. Well, that I am is the same phrase that God answered Moses with when Moses said, who will I tell sent me? And he said to Moses, I am that I am. Tell them I am hath sent thee. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. He's referring to that Old Testament time when he sent Moses. So when he's saying before Abraham was, I am, there's also another interesting part of this phrase that is important to understand, which is why this is expressed as a present tense statement. It's because it is an eternally present tense. It can be rendered, I am that I was, I was that I will be, I am that I will be. All of those things are true. It is speaking of eternity ex in existence. In other words, as, as John declared at the beginning, of the gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John came to understand this deep truth about who Jesus is. So when Jesus says, I am, he is declaring his deity openly, so openly that they knew that if he was not who he said he was, he was a liar and he deserved to be stoned. But as you see here, Jesus says, if I glor... Um, hang on, it's... Okay, here he says, if I say I don't know the Father, I will be a liar like you. That's a bold statement. That's a tremendously bold statement. He's saying, look, if I'm not who I say I am, I'm a liar. And then he calls himself, I am. One of the I am statements in the gospel. And that is an amazing thing to think about. And it is a very, very strong claim to deity. And that's not us deriving something from ideas we might get from other passages in the scripture. This is Jesus openly declaring, I am God. There's no question about it. And right in this same thing, he says, if I don't know the Father, then I'm a liar. Or if I say I don't know the Father, then I'm a liar. I need to say I know the Father because I do know the Father. And I know the Father in a different way than you do. That's because he and I are one. One being, two persons. The Holy Spirit makes three. We also see this idea of his physical resurrection, which is key to our salvation. Again, this is dogma. This is something, if you don't believe this, you're not saved. As a matter of fact, somebody want to read Luke 24, verses 2 through 9. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his, wo his words, and returned from the tomb, and reported all these things to the eleven, and to all the rest. So here we see the account of the resurrection, at least as reported by the witnesses. Somebody want to read Romans 10, 8 through 10. Say, the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we, which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. For with the heart of a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So we see here that confessing Jesus is not enough. We also need to believe that God raised him from the dead. Those two things are important to our salvation. Believing that Jesus was raised from the dead is key to my salvation. Having genuine faith that he delivers from death. Absolutely necessary. As a matter of fact, Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians when he's talking about the fact that some of the believers were starting to deny this idea of a resurrection. 
And he says this, if the dead are not raised, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 16 and 17. It says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worse, worthless. You are still in your sins. So he's saying, Christ's resurrection is a fact. And if it didn't happen, you're still in your sins. It's important for us to understand that our faith in the resurrection is based on the fact that God raised him from the dead. And it's important, crucially important. And again, this is why Satan attacks these concepts. This is why Satan attacks these ideas that the Bible teaches. Because if you can get someone to give up on these ideas, they're not genuinely saved. So it's important, again, crucial to our eternal destination. The virgin birth is also one that is crucial to our salvation because the virgin birth is what allows God to become human. Somebody want to read Matthew 1, 21 through 23. She will bear a son, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which translated means God with us. So here again, we're seeing that this is a prophecy concerning Jesus. And then we look also at the fulfillment of that prophecy in Luke 1, 27 to 31. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of situation, salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. And then on the idea of sinlessness, first of all, in order for him to be sinless, he needed to be born of a different kind of source. He needed to be both divine and human. Mary was the human. The father was the divine. And that is how the virgin birth happened, is God created a person through Mary. And this person is Jesus. And this person is unique in all the universe. He is both divine and human. And the only way he could be sinless as if he was born of a virgin, so that he had the essential human nature, well, the essential humanity with the divine nature. And that's important for us to understand that this divine nature is the key to who he is. We also see in in this idea of his sinlessness, which, again, they try to downplay. As a matter of fact, there are some interesting things on YouTube that talk about Jesus being a racist and a sinner and all sorts of other things out there that are just, they, they are just out there. But this one here, 1 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21, I'm going to read it. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, 
to be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to, uh, to be sin on our behalf so that we may, might become the righteousness of God in him. So we see here that God, th that idea, and again, it's very important to understand that this penal substitutionary atonement that we talked about earlier, and it comes around full circle. It won't work unless he is sinless. So he had to be sinless in order to take the punishment for my sin. That way, he can take his righteousness and give it to me. When I re receive Christ as my Savior, as Paul says in different places and in his letters, I have put on Christ. It's like putting on a piece of clothing. And when I put on Christ, he guards myself, guards me as a person. The whole armor is tied to Jesus himself being that guardian. He does the things to protect me. But also, when God looks down at my sinful self, he sees Jesus because I have put on Christ. It's not like I don't sin, but it's like my sins have been paid for. And that's what salvation is about. And that those are the key ideas that we need to have a clear and full grasp of in order to understand that when somebody tries to convince us Jesus was a sinner, we can say, no, he wasn't. The Bible's clear about that. Not just by what's said in the Gospels and the life that we see him live in the Gospels and all the testimony about who he is, but also about the fact that the whole idea of our salvation is wrapped up in he is sinless, he is holy. And that is crucial to our salvation, is to know and testify who Jesus is and also believe that God raised him from the dead. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the love and the grace and the kindness that you have shown to us. We thank you that you have provided a way for us to obtain forgiveness, and that forgiveness is 100% by your grace. And it's because of your mercy you extended that grace to us. And we pray that by your grace we will actually walk in newness of life. That we will actually live the testimony you would have us to live. That we will do the things that you want us to do. And be there for others and speak for you. That others may be convinced and turn away from their sin and to you. In Jesus' name, amen.